what is existence, what is non-existence, profound questions, questions that are profound because there is a question there to ask those questions, but perhaps this is only a philosophical quandary conundrum because the questioner, the one who assigns meanings and definitions, has forgotten that distinctions are imagined and thereby becomes once removed through the assumption that imagined distinctions have some kind of separated existence independent of the imagination, its distinctions and the meanings and definitions it assigns to those distinctions. This is the crux of the entire matter. Perhaps if you understand there is nothing to understand and that what you seek to understand cannot be understood with the tool of understanding. It's not a matter of belief or disbelief. In fact, belief and disbelief are self-imposed blinders that keep you harnessed, yoked, and continually lost in a maze of confusion. You're not going to unravel the issue of assigned distinctions by assigning yet even more distinctions to those assigned distinctions. This is another difficulty. Trying to use thoughts and concepts to comprehend the incomprehensible that which can only be unraveled and brought to light through an approach of non-thought and non-concept. This is more than most people can stand. The implication that logic, reason, and common sense are inadequate tools to grasp the ungraspable. This may seem ironic, but it makes perfect sense because it's completely illogical. Intelligence is a handy tool only when dealing with the superficial. If you seek to organize surface appearance phenomenal content, then intelligence is a strength. But if you seek to pierce the surface and delve below, the deeper and deeper you go, the more and more intelligence becomes a handicap. This is why knowledge isn't the answer to anything foundational. It can only convolute what is simple and give it an appearance of being seemingly complex. Data is only clutter in a mind and leaves one unable to receive. Only a clear, open, empty mind is in a condition to receive that which falls outside of knowledge and data. Now, when it comes to questioning philosophically the functional superficial existence, there are certain questions that are irrelevant, especially ones concerning certain possibilities of a perceived reality. These kind of questions are not going to get you anywhere because they deal with a specific connotation of existence. The majority of them deal in speculations that the source of reality can be found outside of oneself in some separated external factor. These are the kind of questions that give an open answer if you ask them one way, but give the same open answer if you twist them around and ask them the other way. For example, is it possible for God to exist? Yes. Is it possible for God not to exist? Yes. Is it impossible for God to exist? No. Is it impossible for God not to exist? No. Okay, so what have you clarified? Contrast that against a tangible question. Is it possible for pigs to fly? No. Is it possible for a pig not to fly? Yes. And this isn't even a matter of knowledge or knowledge yet to be had. 
The fact that pigs might fly somewhere else in the universe is inconsequential. Knowledge of the superficial aspects of a reality context is built on what is, not on what could be or might be. And the knowledge is only knowledge to begin with because it is based on what one is able to experience. Based on our experiences of this reality context thus far, pigs do not fly. And until our experience dictates otherwise, it's safe to conclude that pigs don't fly. We can certainly imagine pigs flying, but this alone won't undo or modify the already established attached to distinction. And that's a fascinating aspect of the imagination. It can imagine, realize, and solidify a distinction and then imagine the solidified distinctions in ways contrary to how it's been established. This is like imagination within imagination. We can go to sleep and dream that we are some dream character in a dream world and imagine that this dream persona imagines things within the dream that have no bearing on the dream. We might wake up from this dream only to find ourselves in another dream. A dream within a dream, within a dream. The imagination has no end. What you call the real existing reality is only a layer of the imagination that you have temporarily formed an attachment to, and hence it has become a construct of the imagination. Yet, despite all the layers of the imagination, the imagination has no inherent distinctions. It produces distinctions, but doesn't have any distinctions. Nor can it be identified by any of the distinctions it produces. It is a nothingness that is whole and indivisible. This is why it's not a matter of other people being phantom projections of your mind. There is no you. There are no others, and there is no mind. All of these things are all inherently equally the same. The essence of imagination. The oneness of nothing. That only gives birth to an appearance of fragmentation and separation through an imagination of distinctions. So is it possible that nothing exists? Not really just possible, but the nothingness itself is the only thing that does exist. And of course people don't like this. It threatens every value, belief, meaning, and purpose. In other words, all the clinging attachments. But if not from nothing, from where would existence manifest? Perhaps it was designed, or was it eternally, infinitely, always so? If you go with a design theory that existence was either produced, generated, or the effect of something else, then you are basically saying that existence came from another aspect that exists. If existence came from existence, then it already existed and did not come to be. So is there a beginning or not? And if there is a beginning, what came before the beginning? It can't be non-existence because non-existence is an aspect of existence. Even if existence came from non-existence, it came from an aspect that exists. In this case, non-existence. So what came before the non-existence? You have nowhere to go other than nothing. But of course, that can't be. So therefore, you have no other choice than to say that it is infinite and eternal. If something can't come from nothing, and something always has to come from something else, then designed or not, there is no beginning. If there is no beginning, there is no ending. And therefore, definitely nothing exists. 
If existence is infinite and eternal, then for sure it could not have been generated or designed, but was always so. But even so, being eternal and infinite, where is it located? What is its position? Where exactly can something be said to be existing? If existence has no position or location, no beginning or end, then it is nowhere. If it is nowhere, then it doesn't exist. For if anything exists, it must be somewhere. And nowhere is not a somewhere. Perhaps you will say it is limited and finite. And if so, then it did have to have a beginning and an end. And moreover, this finite, limited existence would need to be contextualized. So now we're back to the question of what came before the beginning and what comes after the end. And what exactly is the context of existence? And what is the context of the context? In the context of the context of the context. And this seems to be leading right back to the infinite and eternal. You can't just say it's finite and leave it at that. Where is this finite existence existing? Where is it located? Then there is another problem. Mankind likes to define existence as things that have substantiality independent of the mind. Yet this definition is wholly contingent on a mind, which has no way to prove that anything exists in its absence. Yet mankind insists that what's outside the mind is real and existing, while whatever occurs inside the mind is unreal and non-existing. If this is true, then nothing exists, for there is nothing that can be considered without the mind. If the considerations of a mind are non-existent, then so are the items of consideration. If certain characteristics or attributes of what is considered, then being considered is also an attribute of recognizing characteristics. Moreover, if everything inside the mind is unreal, and reality is mind-created, then nothing exists other than in the mind. Then there are people who point out, illusion or not, I'm still experiencing an experience the same. So whether or not we are in a matrix doesn't matter. It doesn't change the frame of reference. Well, yeah, and that's exactly the point. So therefore, existence is more aptly defined as awareness of a temporary experience. What you are experiencing, however vivid and impactful, doesn't have any substantiality on its own outside your awareness of your experience of it. So therefore, nothing really exists, despite one's experience of existence. No more than your reflection in the mirror have an existence beyond the mirror. No more than the music continues playing after the band has stopped. Wherein is the narrative and storyline of a movie beyond the movie? Where are the ripples existing after you've thrown a rock and the water returns to stillness? We go to bed at night and have a fantastic array of varying dreams, replete with feelings, perceptions, narratives, thoughts, shapes, locations, textures, and positions. A wide variety of a multitude of different experiences. And so, does the dream world you've dreamed have some kind of existence on its own after you've woken up? If so, where exactly is this dream existing? <laughs>